Thank you, and thanks to the organisers for giving me a very difficult topic this morning. Um, but it's actually an interesting one, and I'm pleased to say I spent many, many years during my PhD working on diabetic cardiomyopathy, but I'm also pleased to say I will not torture you with long-winded basic science diagrams today. I'll keep it very, very clinical. So disclosures as it relates to diabetes, I've worked with almost every diabetic company, and so uh, I'm also an Australian, so please take what I say with a grain of salt. Now, the objectives today are really to focus on this issue of diabetes and heart failure. You heard about it before in the last session. You heard about it again um, with the last two excellent talks by our speakers. But really what I want to focus in on this particular issue of, is there something specific about diabetes which drives a substrate which predisposes towards adverse outcomes independent of what we usually associate with diabetes, which is coronary artery disease. And I hope at the end that I'll convince you all, without any shadow of a doubt, that diabetic cardiomyopathy is indeed real. So when I was thinking about this, this particular topic, I thought, well, I'm not a very smart person. I need to take some wisdom and knowledge from someone who is. So who smarter is there at the moment than good old Albert Einstein? And this was a nice quote that I found. I believe in intuition and inspiration. Imagination, and I'll focus on imagination with the topic imagined, is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. It is, strictly speaking, a real factor in scientific research. So why did I pick this particular quote? Well, two reasons. One, I hope some of the wisdom that Albert Einstein uh, gave to the world will actually directly uh, rub off on myself. But also, if you don't believe what I say at the end, you'll use your imagination to, to, to believe with me that diabetic cardiomyopathy is actually a real problem. So where do we stand with diabetic heart disease at the moment in Canada? And these are the sort of standard facts you'll hear. We know at the moment there are three million patients in Canada with type 2 diabetes. 10 million have either type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. So that's almost one in every four persons. One in every 10 deaths is now directly related to diabetes. The costs are enormous and about 80% of those deaths are directly related to coronary artery disease and cardiovascular complications. And to put it in another way, and I used this slide before, about a third of all heart attacks and strokes, two fifths of all heart failure admissions, two thirds of all non-traumatic amputations, and about half patients going on dialysis is a as a direct result of diabetes. So when we're thinking about diabetic cardiomyopathy, is there something special about it that drives these terrible adverse events and factors that we're seeing in Canada today? So what I thought I would do is start off with the definition of cardiomyopathy and then try and convince you over the next 10 minutes or so that in fact diabetes meets all the criteria for a cardiomyopathy. So, what is the WHO definition? It's actually, this is from 1995, it's fairly broad. Cardiomyopathies are defined as diseases of the myocardium associated with cardiac dysfunction. You can sort of throw anything in there, I believe, uh, but I think that tells you at the time that it was done, people were better trying to understand what actually drives cardiac dysfunction. But when we think of diabetic cardiomyopathy, this is the sort of typical definition that is used currently. It comprises structural and functional abnormalities of the myocardium in diabetic patients without coronary artery disease or hypertension. So it's occurring independent of that. And this is not something that's new. This has been around for many years. If you go back to 1972 with Rubler, four patients he studied, autopsy finding, and demonstrated that there was diabetic renal microangiopathy in associated with a dilated left ventricle. Cannell then got on the bandwagon and followed this up in the Framingham study and demonstrated, well, it's interesting if you look at diabetic subjects, men have a twofold increase in heart failure and women have a five-fold increase in heart failure. So there's something about diabetes that's driving this heart failure phenotype. They had worse symptoms for any level of cardiac function and that these risks persisted after we adjusted for the usual factors that we think drive the heart failure phenotype, CAD, age, blood pressure, et cetera. Subsequently, a number of other studies, contemporary studies, and I've just listed a few here, have gone on to continue to show that this relationship still exists to today. So there's something about diabetes that is predisposing towards this heart failure phenotype. 
So I think in order to really convince you that diabetic cardiomyopathy is real, I put up this particular um, uh, uh, slide here, which is the standard AHA ACC slide talking about the stages of heart failure. And if we look at stage A, that's patients who have risk factors but do not yet actually have any structural abnormalities in the heart. Stage B are those patients who have structural abnormalities but without symptoms. C, abnormalities plus symptoms and then D, we're ending in the refractory heart failure. And the purpose of putting up the stages is, as you know, you progress from stage A to stage B to stage C. And this is a different progression than New York Heart Association where you can go from class two to four and back again. This is an inexorable process. So if I'm to convince you that diabetic cardiomyopathy is real, that if we start off with stage A, that there should be, as a direct result of diabetes, a chronic progression through these stages. And that's what I'm gonna focus on. Now there's been a lot, of a lot of stuff written about this too. This was an editorial back in 1999 that Diabetes in heart failure was the frequent, forgotten, and often fatal complication of diabetes. Yet, as you know, we've predominantly focused on heart attack and stroke. And up until recently, although it was a big problem, we didn't really focus on it. So what data have we got to actually show that diabetes per se increases the risk of heart failure? This is very simple analysis. This is looking at plasma glucose levels from the on-target transcend studies done by Salim Youssef and the MAC group. And what it showed was that for every increasing level of glucose, this is low normal, high normal, impaired glucose tolerance, new onset type 2 diabetes, established type 2 diabetes, that there was a significant increase in the rates of heart failure hospitalization. Again, trying to draw this link between diabetes, heart failure. If we go back to the old UK PDS trial, we know for every 1% increase in HbA1c, there's about a 16% increase in the risk of development of heart failure. Now, more contemporary trials have probably said that this 16% is a little overblown, and it's probably about 8%, but again, this has been replicated time and time again. As diabetic control worsens, the risk of heart failure increases. And we know that this is not just in patients who are at the extremes of age. If we look at patients who have type 2 diabetes that are in the 40-year age group, their risk of heart failure is dramatically increased, approximately 25-fold in the age group around 40 to 50 years of age, relative to aged and sex-matched cohort. So it's not just a disease of ageing where other comorbidities is, comes in, it's where in the, present, in the absence of other comorbidities, there's this association between heart failure and diabetes. Further information to support that there's something specific about diabetes is data from this. And this is the iPreserve trial. And as you know, this was a trial looking at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and the uh, angiotensin receptor blocker Herbisartan. But what the authors very um, uh, cleverly did was just look at, well, what is the impact of diabetes in this particular cohort? And the composite endpoint they studied here was heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. And the mere presence of diabetes dramatically increase the risk. So hopefully we're building up a story here. Heart failure is associated with diabetes. If you have diabetes, your outcomes of heart failure are worse. But if there's one important thing that I want to take home from uh, this particular talk today is that still, whether or not there is a diabetic cardiomyopathy or not, you're still, it's absolutely paramount that in every patient we rule out coronary artery disease, the same with HEFPEF per se. But what I would like to uh, take, the other take home message I'd like to get across is that probably these two things are not separate, but they're actually interrelated. So if you have a diabetic cardiomyopathy and then you develop CAD, your outcomes are likely to be much worse. And is there data to support that? Well, yes, there is. So this is data going back to the old say, SOLVE trial, looking at uh, in Alipril back in the early 90s. And just to bring your attention, this is the outcome of all-cause mortality. So this is the all-cause mortality rates in patients that were involved in this trial, which were predominantly uh, coronary events, in patients who just had ischemic heart disease. So you can see over the uh, sort of two or th uh, sorry five, ten-year time frame that there was a significant increase in mortality. If we take those patients that had superimposed diabetes on ischemic heart disease, we can see that the outcomes are substantially worsened again, suggesting that you've got a primed problem with the myocardium, you superimpose another insult on it, outcomes are likely to be much worse.
So where do we stand in terms of clinical findings today? I've tried to make the case that there's something bad about diabetes and it predisposes to adverse outcomes. Well, this is the sort of, I guess, best understanding of a definition of diabetic cardiomyopathy. There's evidence of hypertrophy, and this is sort of a, a, a cartoon here demonstrating left ventricular hypertrophy with evidence of abnormal diastolic filling, left atrial enlargement, um, and this may, there may be subclinical involvement when you use more sort of subtle techniques to look at uh, uh, LV dysfunction, such as strain rate or using MRI. But I think at this point in time, these appear to be the key findings to suggest that there is a specific impact of diabetes on the heart. And what data have we got to support that? Well, if you go back, and this was a paper published many years ago, but the data is exactly the same. If you take diabetic cohort with or without hypertension and patients with impaired glucose tolerance and you look at their hearts, there's one key factor that seems to drive through. The majority of these patients do have left ventricular hypertrophy that is independent of underlying hypertension. So that seems to be a key feature that occurs. Secondly, a lot of people have said to me, well, we know they're diabetics. They have bigger heart attacks, their function is worse, so it's not surprising that they do worse. So there's no specific problem in the myocardium per se, it's just diabetes, worse heart attacks, worse outcomes. Well, if you go back and look at data from the SAVE trial, which was looking at Captopril, in fact, this was a nice analysis by Scott Solomon showing that ventricular remodeling was not worse. Their end diastolic volumes, end systolic volumes, and ejection fractions were identical when you compared diabetics to non-diabetics. If we take more contemporary data, again look at the same endpoints, again we see the same findings. There is no worsening of ejection fraction or volumes in the heart following a additive insult such as a myocardial infarction in patients with diabetes. So what then drives the worst prognosis? And this is direct conclusion from that trial. Compared with non-diabetic patients, diabetic patients are at increased risk of CV events post MI, despite no greater LV enlargement or reduction in systolic function, but there appears to be a propensity towards concentric remodeling, left ventricular hypertrophy, and increased filling pressures. So if we think that's what's driving it, do we have any other evidence to support the diagnosis that there's a specific effect of diabetes on the myocardium? Now, before I get into that, I just wanted to bring out one point that one of the other issues we've, and difficulties we've had in studying this particular topic is that, like HEF-PEF, this is a heterogeneous condition. Individual patients respond very differently to the insult of diabetes. And this was nicely demonstrated in this recent collaborative study between uh, 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 Genevieve Demereau in Paris and the Aussie group with Tom Marwick. And what they did is took 850 patients who were, uh, had normal renal function and no overt coronary disease, and they did this cluster hierarchical analysis based on detailed echocardiographic analysis to determine, well, how do these patients respond? And do patients respond differently and have different outcomes. And that's exactly what they found. So what they identified was that there were three particular clusters. You see the green cluster here, which was men. These were all patients with diabetes, remember, relatively normal renal function, no overt coronary disease. And there was a subgroup of men that had preserved systolic function and diastolic function. There was this group here of, um, of uh, uh, cluster two, which was a, obese and hypertensive women with diastolic dysfunction, and there was a third cluster, again, of men who had significant hypertrophy and a reduction in LV systolic function. And if we look at the impact of this on CV mortality and hospitalization, you can see differential responses will drive different outcomes. So not everyone responds the same. So if you're looking for a single definition which describes everyone with diabetic cardiomyopathy, you're not going to find it. We need to understand it better because different patients will respond differently. But what are the underlying typical features? Now this is a study that would never be done anywhere else in the world. It was a German study. Patients who presented that were thought to have myocarditis. They underwent left ventricular endo myocardial biopsy, a coronary angiogram, and an MRI, and they looked at the diabetic subgroup. And because this, as I said, this is left ventricular endomyocardial biopsy data, the key findings they found was at any given level of pressure, sorry, at, at any given level of end diastolic volume, the pressures were higher. There was evidence of fibrosis in the heart and advanced glycation end products. Now, why is this important? These hearts are full of collagen. 
collagen has the same tensile strength as steel. So if you've got a heart full of steel, it's not surprising it's stiff, and it's not surprising then that you may develop heart failure. And this was uh, uh, both in the HEF-REF and the HEF-PEF patients that they studied. I mentioned before that I'm not going to torture you with a whole lot of mechanisms other than to say over the last 30 years there is a wealth of preclinical data to demonstrate that there are multiple biological mechanisms which can demonstrate that hyperglycemia can, per se can directly affect the myocardium. But probably the best way to think about it is this more recent data from Walter Paulus, and if you haven't read any of, his, any of his work, I would suggest you do, and he's tried to then delve further into why we see these sort of different phenotypes that may coexist within the diabetic cardiomyopathy phenotype. And what he's basically come up with is that, obviously, you have diabetes and you can go down this HEF-PEF pathway or HEF-REF pathway, but there are very different reasons why you may develop. In the HEF-PEF pathway, the predominant abnormalities, coronary, microvascular, endothelial dysfunction, which activates factors such as protein kinase G, which increases hypertrophy and fibrosis, and you get reactive interstitial fibrosis, but the ejection fraction is preserved. Whereas in the HEF-REF phenotype, the diabetes preferentially activates endothelial cell death and microvascular rarefaction, which results in reactive oxygen species and replacement fibrosis, which then directly overall impacts the systolic function. So we see these very different pathways. However, the underlying factor is diabetes drives that. Now, if you don't believe all that, and this is the last slide, we have the Empereg outcome and canvas trials, which demonstrated in drugs that the SGLT2 inhibitors did not have a big impact on non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. The overall MACE endpoint was positive, but looking at specific coronary endpoints, they were not particularly um, uh, uh, they did not demonstrate a uh, uh, individual uh, positive endpoint, and yet we saw with these agents substantial in, uh, improvements in heart failure hospitalization, again suggesting that there's something about diabetes that's driving this heart failure phenotype, and I put it to you that it's this underlying diabetic cardiomyopathy that exists independent of coronary artery disease that is driving the propensity to heart failure. So hopefully at the end of all that, a lot of data, but hopefully you'll agree with me that diabetic cardiomyopathy is real um, and that there's no doubt diabetes is a major cause of heart failure. It is, however, and the diabetic cardiomyopathy phenotype is heterogeneous and it's complex, it's multifactorial, and we need to better understand all these different phenotypes because if we're going to develop further drug therapy, we need to understand which phenotype you have to target the drug towards that particular phenotype and hopefully we'll continue to have big wins and be able to offer our patients better therapies. We know that the recent cardiovascular outcome safety trials have demonstrated improvements in heart failure outcomes, and hopefully with the bona fide heart failure studies, we'll get more uh, information. But clearly, this is going to drive further studies into mechanism phenotypes and therapies to improve prognosis in patients with this real entity of diabetic cardiomyopathy. Thank you very much.